Great. Go ahead and share my screen here. Welcome to the GIS Birds of a Feather at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Amanda Zarang and I use the she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and I am the Director of Digital Strategies and Innovation at Texas Women's University and a member of the TCDL Planning Committee. I am pleased to be your session moderator today. Sounds like y'all have made it very, very easy for me. Uh, first, some housekeeping. The Texas Digital Library and TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. You can also view our code of conduct on tdl.org, and I am going to quickly put a link into chat. Today's meeting will run until approximately 2.50. Please feel free to take breaks as you need. I invite you to say hello in chat and let us know where you're joining from resources and make comments throughout today's session. Um, you are also encouraged to post your questions. Today's Bird of a Feather session will be facilitated by Josh Bean, Bin, and I will be watching for your questions in Q&A and share them with Josh. With that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, to the GIS Birds of a Feather session at TCDL 2022. Uh, this session uh, is hosted by the Texas Digital Library's GIS Interest Group, which I have the great pleasure to chair this year until Kate Carter, who is on this call from UH Clear Lake, takes over next year. This is an open discussion session, but we do have a brief and flexible agenda get to that here. Um, first, Kate will lead us through introductions. Then I have a little icebreaker activity for us to identify the happiest counties in Texas. Then uh, Michael Shensky from UT, who is the founder of the TDL GIS interest group, will provide a brief history and overview of the group. Uh, I will then mention our very active subcommittees with a focus on how you can become involved if you choose to do so. And then hopefully uh, sooner rather than later, uh, we will have an open-ended GIS discussion. Uh, to make it easier on Kate for these introductions, let me just go ahead and introduce myself first. Um, like I said, my name is Joshua Bin. I'm the Director of Data and Digital Scholarship at Baylor University Libraries. Uh, my research interests in data science education include text data mining, data visualization, and geospatial research. Now, only in the last year has our library taken the responsibilities to fund our ArcGIS license and also support GIS research. But I was previously the GIS librarian at UT Arlington for over 10 years. So it's all coming slowly back to me like riding a bike. Take it away, Kate. All right, thank you, Josh. Um, so yeah, as Josh mentioned, um, I am Kate McNally Carter. I'm from University of Houston, Clear Lake, and I'm a research and instruction librarian and I'm currently serving as the vice chair for the GIS interest group. Um, so I think in order to ex ex expedite our um, program, which is you know our, our informal agenda, but I wanna make sure we have as much time as possible for discussion, um, I'll go ahead and call on people to uh, quickly introduce themselves. So just your name, um, your pronouns as well, if you're um, comfortable with sharing that, uh, my pronouns are she, her and also um, your institution and, and uh, your position at that institution. And so that way we have enough time for the icebreaker activity. So we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Michael Shensky. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Shensky. I'm the GIS and Geospatial Data Coordinator at UT Austin. Uh, I use uh, he, him pronouns and uh, I'm the former um, uh, chair of the GIS interest group for last year. And um, excited to be here today. Um, uh, you know, I, in my position, I'm fortunate enough to, to work with uh, all aspects of GIS geospatial data, um, and I'm really excited about uh, hearing what, what all of you are doing with uh, GIS or what your interests are. Okay, next we'll um, hear from Cynthia Henry. 
Hi everyone, my name is Cynthia Henry and I am the College of Human Sciences librarian um, in the reference department here at Texas Tech University. Okay, going down the list, Christina. Hi everyone, I'm Christina Clonch and I'm with Sam Houston State University, a research librarian for geography and several other departments. <laughs> okay, next we have Jennifer Flaxpart. Hi, I'm Jennifer Flexpart. My pronoun, pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm at the University of Texas Libraries in Austin as the Associate Director um, for, it, sorry, it's actually Assistant Director, AD is what I normally say, for research support and digital initiatives, and I am a longtime advocate of GIS and geospatial data work as a part of the research data lifecycle. Um, and I'm a member of our Geodata Working Group at UT Austin, led by Michael Shinsky. Great. We have Elliot Williams. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elliot Williams. I use he, him pronouns, and I am at Texas Digital Library as the DPLA Metadata Aggregation Service Coordinator. Okay, next we have Sylvia. Oh, Sylvia, I think you're still muted. Hi, I'm Sylvia Jones, and I am the science and engineering librarian here at SMU. And I also work with the, um, geospatial, the special literacy initiatives here, and I'm a member of the interest group as well. All right, next we have Catherine Strickland. Hi everyone, I'm the maps coordinator for the UT libraries. I see oversee a large physical mm -hmm. map collection, PCL map collection. And I'm here because I deal with geospatial objects. All right, next, Katie Pierce Meyer. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Katie Pierce Meyer, she, her uh, pronouns. I also am at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm the head of architectural collections, um, the architecture and planning uh, library liaison, and I work closely with Kat, Jennifer, and Michael um, we're part, as part of the Geodata Working Group at UT. All right, next we have Diane Lopez. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Diane Lopez. I am um, a library. I'm trying to remember what my thoughts are right now. Uh, I'm a librarian at UTSA. Um, I uh, take care of architecture and planning um, along with social work, um, public administration and demography and construction science. I'm also a part of the GIS interest group. Um, and right now I'm kind of starting off the initiatives um, with GIS here at UTSA. I really honestly, thanks to this group um, have helped me a lot. <laughs> Okay, next we have Frank. I think Frank Smutniak, is that, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay, maybe he stepped away. So we will um, move on to um, next on the list is Albert Duran. Albert is trying to connect to audio. Okay, Albert, are you there? All right, going once, going twice. Um, let's go ahead and try uh, Scott Pope. Are you there? Hi, this is uh, Scott Pope from Texas State University and I'm a acquisitions librarian. Nice to meet you. Albert, are you there? Hello, can you hear Hi. me? Hi, yes. Hi, I'm Albert Duran. I'm at Houston Public Library and I'm the metadata librarian. Thank you. Great, nice to meet you, Albert. Um, okay, um, next we have uh, Mimi. Hello, I'm just a PhD student at UNT studying information science and I'll be taking GIS this summer. Great, awesome. Well, you should definitely connect with this group because we can we can help you out. 
Um, next, we have Amy Bui. Uh, hi, I'm Amy Bui, and I am uh, the Blossoming Classics Librarian at UT San Antonio. So I'm actually Diane's coworker. <laughs> uh, we coordinate student engagement together, and I also uh, am the liaison for the Honors College. So even though my first part of my title has nothing to do with GIS, I've noticed in recent years that um, the Honors students and some of the um, other departments on campus, they want to do like these GIS related projects. So I thought I would come and uh, listen in to see what I could learn. Awesome. Great. All right, let's see. People have moved around here on my screen. Susan Whitmer. Hello, I'm Susan Whitmer. I'm a digital projects librarian at Texas Women's University. And <clears throat> I'm a big fan of distance cycling. And one of my favorite cyclists is Simon Richardson of the Global Cycling Network. And every Every video he makes, he brings up the fact that he is a he was a geography major in college. So I've always loved geography. And GIS is just a, a click or two above my head, and I'm trying to get into it. Awesome. That's great. Thanks for the, the background. Um, OK, next we have Courtney Muma. Hey y'all, Courtney Muma here. I'm the deputy director of TDL and TDL is extremely, extremely proud and impressed by this particular working group. So quickly, y'all have done so much to bring together GIS folks in Texas. We love to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. We couldn't do it without you. <laughs> um, and then next we have Josh Conrad. Hi, Josh Conrad. He, him. I'm a PhD student at UT Austin. Um, I, I work in GIS and I'm, I'm at the School of Architecture. I'm studying the history of um, geodata in historic preservation work, um, pre-digital and post-digital. Awesome. Okay. And then um, I think the last person we have on the list is Kevin Day. Hi, I'm Kevin Day. I work at Texas A&M Libraries, and I'm just here. I'm a programmer. I'm just here to see the um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we'll try Frank one more time. Are you there, Frank? I, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm having audio yeah. troubles. Yes, you can hear just Frank, fine. Frank Smutniak, I, I'm a software developer at uh, Texas Digital Libraries. I'm just here to, to learn a few things. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. I don't think I missed anybody, but um, did I miss, miss anyone? I think, I think that might be it. All right, Josh, you can take it away. All right. Thank you, Kate. Great meeting, everyone. We have a little icebreaker activity here, but I'm going to make sure uh, that we do not spend too much time and we get right down into uh, our discussion here. Uh, we created this uh, quick little um, exercise here. Let me copy this and see if I can pop it into the chat in case you guys wanted to uh, follow along on your own computer, or I'll just do it here for all of us to. All right. Uh, so this is a Tableau driven tool that we created just for this session. It's just a way to have something informal and maybe a little fun to play around with. Uh, this tool in a very non-serious way tries to answer the question of which county in Texas has the happiest residents, or to put another way, which county should you move to if you wanna maximize your happiness? A perfect research question for GIS. Uh, so we are looking at a map here of the counties in Texas, uh, but in case you are curious about another state, you can go ahead and use this dropdown and select any other state in the US. Um, Step two right here that I'm gonna use this dropdown contains the criteria that we're gonna use to identify the happiest counties. Uh, so first, if I select income here, uh, what we see is that Rockwall County has the highest income. Uh, you can see the legend on the bottom goes from all of the variables, whichever we select, goes from gold low to this um, pink purple high. Here we are also going to consider the percent male population, as well as the inverse percent female population. 
we're going to consider uh, continuing with some census data, the percent of adults with a bachelor degree, the population density per square mile, the percent of the population in each county that was born in a different state, the percent employed as a teacher or a librarian, which I think is a big indicator, and uh, the single, bi single biggest factor, in my opinion, to calculate happiness levels of the percent of the population who watch hockey at least four times per year. Uh, now, to calculate the happiness score, uh, what we need to do is, uh, under here, is we need to assign weights to each of these categories. Ah, almost forgot. First, for the step two, we need to change this to the weighted values. So right now, what we need to do is our weights add up to 0, 0.0. We need them to equal 1.0. So for example, if I decide, and I'm in, I'm in control of this screen, so I'm going to decide, I'm going to put 0.3 for the uh, weight for the percent of the population who watch hockey on television at least four times per year. And by entering 0.3, I can see that our sum of all of our weights are 0 0.3. That represents 30%. So we have 60% more to assign. Uh, what do you guys think? What is another category here that we have included between education, uh, gender breakdown, income population density, born somewhere else, or employed as a teacher or a librarian? What else do you think would be another indicator for to calculate our happiness score here. Bicycle infrastructure, the number of cyclists or um, in bicycling infrastructure, that should make everyone happy. <laughs> it should, and I wish I had spoken. This is, am I reading it right? This is Susan, yes it is. But thank you, Catherine, for verifying. I wish I had spoken to you about this yesterday. We could have hunted down some of that data and added it, but unfortunately, uh, I don't want you guys to watch me going and hunting down that data. Okay. Uh, so maybe what I'll do instead is I will put, because I know we're all thinking employed as a teacher or a librarian, you can't have happiness without that. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a 0.3 for there as well. So now we're looking at 60%, right? And of course, leaving zero for a particular category multiplies it by zero, so it negates it. So we just need 40% uh, from somewhere. And maybe just to hurry this up, I will go ahead and put 20% or 0.2 under born in a different state. And maybe for income, I'll go ahead and put the final 20%. And so based on our very scientific and deep thought criteria, we have identified for the top five, Kennedy County, Hudspeth, Duval, Kinney, and San Saba represent the happiest counties in Texas. And of course, at any time you can go in and change it to any other state, like my home state of New York, and it will just order, oh, that's not good. Let's not do that. Let's leave it at Texas and end it here. So uh, definitely, uh, let me pop that in here again in case uh, someone had missed that. If you wanna play around with this, that is the URL. And this is an example of something that it's geospatial data, but we did not use any Esri or ARC technology to create this. It was entirely done using Tableau Desktop, the free version, and then hosted on Tableau Public. You can see here in the URL. All right, uh, let's get back to some real business here. Uh, our, fear, our real fearless leader, uh, Michael Shansky, is going to provide an overview of the history of the TDL GIS interest group. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today. I'm so glad to, to see this GIS Birds of a Feather continuing now uh, after several uh, consecutive years of uh, successful GIS Birds of a Feather uh, events uh, here at TC Dale. And uh, just want to give a quick overview of uh, you know how this all got started. Uh, we formed, um, well, actually, I 
we had a few GS uh, Birds of a Feather sessions over the years. The first one I actually think was in 2019. The year after that was the, the pandemic TCDL, unfortunately had to be canceled, but we still had a GS Birds of a Feather uh, that we held uh, a little bit later uh, than TC, uh, TCDL was supposed to be um, scheduled that year. And so we had that in June of 2020. Um, and I was blown away by uh, just how many people were interested in GIS and, and who showed up to, I think we had almost 40 people there. Um, and there was so much interest that um, we all agreed that you know, it would be good for us to, to meet uh, the next month. And then we decided to meet the month after that and the ball really got rolling. And um, soon thereafter, we formed uh, the TDL GIS interest group. Uh, we have many active members. Uh, folks are uh, regularly attending our, our monthly meetings that have continued since June 2020. Um, where we all get to, together as a group, all members of the, the TDLGS interest group. We also have four uh, standing subcommittees that are focused on particular uh, initiatives and, and work in particular areas, and those are also very active and, and meet monthly as well. Um, we have a, a well-established structure now at this point. It's defined by our, our relatively recent group charter that we drafted last year. And we have many significant accomplishments over the last year. Um, uh, one of the most notable being our uh, GIS learning sprint that we held last summer. We're really excited to, to replicate this summer with a, another sprint that we're looking to, to plan for this August. Um, so we have a lot of great stuff going on if you're interested in GIS um, and uh, you know, looking for learning opportunities, looking to make connections with uh, other GIS folks at institutions across the state. Uh, this is a, a great group to be a part of, or at the very least join our mailing list so you can uh, stay up to date on things that we're working on and um, uh, initiatives that, that we're pursuing. And uh, we also have a survey um, that we'll be sending out an updated version of soon, um, uh, asking about um, how you're using GIS within the library at your institution. So we're trying to uh, facilitate collecting that data as well, and, and hopefully that will be useful um, to those across the state that are um, engaging in GIS work through their libraries. So I'm um, really glad to be here and, and happy to see all of you here as well. Um, and glad to, to see this group um, con continuing to, to grow and um, work on new and exciting things. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just like Michael said, uh, we have four uh, extremely active subcommittees. Uh, the mentoring subcommittee facilitates GIS mentoring and uh, I really enjoy, they organize regular informal and fun virtual hangouts. And last year organized our four day sprint to learn GIS. The data collaboration subcommittee uh, is working towards exploring and expanding areas for data collaboration across Texas libraries, including sharing best practices and workflows for geospatial collection development and curation. And what has me the most excited uh, is to assess the viability of a shared geospatial collection and geodata portal infrastructure across Texas institutions. Yes, I read that. I don't speak in such big words regularly. Uh, the survey and outreach uh, down here, the survey and outreach subcommittee is building out our GIS across Texas libraries dashboard that is associated with the form uh, that Michael was just talking about. We have currently have 17 libraries who've contributed their information for this dashboard. Uh, if you want to be in here, the 17 libraries, you can see them listed here and mapped out. There's a lot of data in here about these libraries based on what they specified on the form. If you want to be included, the form is available right here and you'll be able to work your way right through it and thank you very much, Kate. You are awesome for putting all those links in there. Finally, uh, last but not least is our events committee. And they have their own slide here. And this is the last slide before I stop talking. Um, the big endeavor for the events committee, a subcommittee right now is working on our second summer GIS sprint. As you can see, it will be August 9th and 10th with um, 90 minute sessions in the morning and 30 minute follow-up sessions each afternoon. Uh, the focus as voted on by our membership is to learn how to work with GIS and Python specifically. Day one will teach the fundamentals of Python while day two will apply these skills specifically towards GIS and geospatial analysis. Uh, sign up for our list for more information, maybe even to join us. All right, I've talked enough. 
uh, let's get this conversation started. Uh, maybe we can see first if anyone has any uh, particular questions, thoughts, ideas. Maybe you want to tell a story of a GIS happening on your particular campus. Or maybe I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, I think, you know, and I'm going to stop sharing here. You guys are probably relieved not to have to look at my screen anymore. Um, just last summer, uh, I think I had alluded to this a little bit in my introduction. Uh, just last summer, uh, Baylor uh, libraries took over both the um, financial responsibilities for our campus as license, as well as the administration of. Um, we quickly had to scramble and learn how to manage, administer, and set up the ArcGIS online, ArcGIS portals, uh, be able to issue credits, issue accounts, make software be able to download. It was just last summer. You'll get more information about this if you attend the session uh, coming after this, but just last summer um, when this happened, we had the sprint and Michael Shensky and Sylvia Jones, who's on this call as well, I believe, gave a presentation and some really in-depth exercises on managing ArcGIS Online. It was invaluable to me. I'll probably say the same thing in about an hour from now, but um, the sort of getting the conversation started. Does anybody have any examples of uh, working with researchers in GIS or managing GIS collections or sort of just wanting to know how GIS may potentially be used on their campus? No. Does anyone else have, use the Esri software? I know we have, like I just said, we have it on our campus. Are there any uh, folks out there, maybe on your campus, who do not have uh, access to the GIS software? Sorry, to the Esri. The sea of silence is flustering me. I'm stumbling over my words. See, I'll tell you, I had envisioned that you guys would be sick of me talking by now and that you would be biting at the bit, chomping at the bit to have me be quiet so that we can have a real birds of a feather. <laughs> well, um, I, I, oh, go ahead, Diane, go ahead. I actually have a question and maybe I could pick some minds right now, or, or especially on ArcGIS Online. Um, how, how can we make, or is there a way to make things discoverable? Like if you're in a search engine, you're like Google and you type in um, the project that's on Esri ArcGIS Online, but it doesn't appear. Is there a way to make it appear on a route? Like, during a search, like just a normal um, search engine search. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and thanks for sharing that question through the, the TEL uh, GS mailing list. Um, uh, just a, a little while earlier, uh, Diane, and and, um, and uh, also thanks, Josh, for, for responding to that. Um, and, and that's a really good question. Uh, and as soon as I saw your email, I went in and, and checked myself to, to make sure I, I could find it through ArcGIS.com. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't really ever thought about, you know, what can we do to make those, um, you know, types of materials that we're creating through ArcGIS Online also discoverable through, through Google. And so that's a really good question. And I don't actually know the answer to that one. So I think you brought up a really interesting uh, topic. And uh, does anyone else know? Has anybody else ever? investigated that. I think Josh I, Conrad's answer was a good one. Did I just interrupt you? Yeah, I well, oh, no, that's oh. totally fine. I, I would just say that I believe now I my 
my experience with ArcGIS Online has, is, you know, it's a relatively new platform. I have only learned about it over the past couple of years, I think, like everyone else. Um, and really, I learned about it. Um, I mean, it, it, I think it, I think it, it has become popular over the past couple of years because of all the COVID dashboards that have been created using ArcGIS Online. And like every city is, has its own COVID dashboard. Um, how they do it is they embed ArcGIS Online apps into their city website or university website. And you can find them that way. Like if you type in like John Hopkins COVID dashboard, you'll find it um, because it's embedded in their website. And then, and their website is searchable by Google. I think that's what ArcGIS Online kind of intends in a way um, because they don't allow for some reason their content to be directly Google searchable. I don't know why. So I just found uh, the following forum post that has a response um, that, that describes things that you can do to improve um, the, how your uh, materials that you develop and, and uh, create in ArcGIS Online rank in Google search results. So this uh, is a reply from somebody who is a, a product engineer for StoryMap. So I think this is a, probably a pretty good indication of, of what Esri uh, recommends uh, that you do to, to make your uh, ArcGIS Online assets more discoverable. And it looks like it's mentioning embedding just like Josh talked about into yeah. the yeah. website. Seems like yeah. it. Also the, um, the ArcGIS Online, um, I, and I, I mentioned it actually in, this, in that reply also that um, the ArcGIS Online item page, um, it's important to fill all of that metadata out on that item page because um, it makes it searchable even more on ArcGIS Online, um, dot com, ArcGIS .com. Um, I, I recently did a project with the city of Dallas actually um, and their GIS folks there were like really insistent on um, making sure that I filled out all the fields on the, on the ArcGIS Online item pages. And it does make it searchable. When you search ArcGIS online, um, the results, the results um, include like descriptions and all this sort of thing. So it makes things easier to find. Thank you so much for like finding this information. I just saw your email right now and I was like, oh yeah, yes. cool. <laughs> I Good. was like, oh, yes. No, that's a great question. Like I, I've, I do projects at ET and it's like, where do we, how do we, how do people find it? How, where do we put that? Where do we put it? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I feel like that's going to be an issue that arises because a lot of um, the faculty that right now I'm working with is coming out of the history department, mm -hmm. um, and like one of the like that was their question is like, oh, I can't find it on Google, and my students are going to share this with public people and you know with the public and you know things like that because they're trying to like do their network like how you're mentioning like how the COVID um, dashboards became made kind of GIS more visible, um, or like how I like to say it more sexy. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, like, I, I think that is something yeah, that is going to be like having to work with like embedding embedding into like um, the university webpage or like the light for us would be like from the library site. Uh, this is just going to make the like GIS at UTSA is so much more exciting and maybe a little bit more stressful. <laughs> yeah, I really like that solution, Josh. So uh, if I understand right, what you're suggesting would be if we want to make certain that uh, projects hosted on ArcGIS Online can be found by Google is we need to reference them with information on a university website and then yeah. that university website can be picked up by Google. Yeah, it's kind of like great. you have to have like a portal to the, uh, to the app, um, like a little, little splash page on your uh, university site or something, or like your faculty page. It, it, you know, it, it depends on the project where it's appropriate to put it, I guess. But it is, I, I, I will also say that ArcGIS Online makes it easy to embed. Um, it gives you um, iframe links 
and it, it, it they they show up on websites kind of in a really nice way. I thought that was a really, really cool question because I had never ever thought about searching for a story map or anything just like that in Google. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's something to think about. So I appreciate your question and the responses that we've gotten. Thank you. It's an interesting question, Elliot. I don't think I have the answer, but I want to make certain everybody saw that question in the chat. Uh, does anyone add RTS online or other end products uh, like that to it, institutional reserve? Uh, would that be another way to make them discoverable? Oh. I'll just say to kind of add on to what I was thinking, um, just sort of this conversation made me think about like, how would we make other similar types of faculty and student work discoverable? And, and one of those ways is through an institutional repository. Um, so I was just curious if anyone is doing that or, or what, that, what that would even look like. Like, would you try and embed it? Would you just include a link? Um, yeah, I think, I think I have a lot of questions, but. <laughs> We've kind of had that discussion at, um in WAML, which is the Western Association of Map Librarians, uh, especially concerning kind of ESRI products. Um, because people did a lot of work in, in kind of the predecessor to story maps and early iterations of story maps that are no longer supported. And one thing people have done is, um, like create a PDF of screenshots. So you lose kind of the interactive part, but that's how people are putting them in repositories. But it's a great question and it's a great thing for this community to think about. We use, um, not changing the subject, uh, we use Power BI quite a bit here for, uh, analysis and dashboards. And we have put into TDR, for example, uh, even though the Power BI would be uh, visible online, like that's how we run our COVID dashboard. It's Power BI driven, not ArcGIS. But we can save the local project files and place them in TDR, for example. Uh, for those of you who may be more familiar with this, is there an equivalent when you're working in ArcGIS online for uh, just a simple project, story maps, a dashboard, any of those formats. Is there a downloadable, is there some sort of archive that you can download that has not only the data, but also the functionality and the layout? Yeah, I believe it is possible to download uh, certain types of maps from within ArcGIS Link to, to download um, like all the, the associated code. I don't know that it downloads the data. I'm assuming it would download links to you know, like, you know, the services, um, which would be separate. Um, I don't think it makes a copy of the data, but it's been a while since I've uh, made an attempt to, to do that. And I've never done it for the purpose of, of preserving um, anything like long-term, uh, I'll say I've just kind of done it experimentally. I've only been able to download data, like feature layers, um, but not apps, um, which actually is, I, I, it, it, that's actually concerning to me. I, 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 I'd hope that there was, I mean, you know, I hope there, I'd like there to be a more um, clear archive path for those apps. I mean, yeah. I, that story maps that are not, uh, I mean, those old story maps that, that can't be accessed anymore. Is that, the, is that the case? I mean, that's kind of scary, actually. Well, they can be accessed, just some of the functionality has changed. Yeah. Uh, you know, they used to have a lot more options for layout. Um, um, and so it depends. That's, that's another great question. It, it, 
like it's the use case. Like if somebody is not like a GIS power user, if you will, if they're not like, you know, an expert in GIS and using the story aspect more, you know, cause story maps, you can, that's a lot of narrative in there. And that's kind of um, the flow of that's what got lost when they, I mean, there's, it's, that, that's also the question between proprietary because a lot of what you can download is um, proprietary and it gets like if you're depending on it online. Um, I'm rambling now, so I'm going to mute. I have, um, I did an ArcGIS online um, project where I converted it all to a PDF um, and stored it in our project folder that way. I, that was, it, it was, it worked for our project uh, because there wasn't any, it, it didn't remove any kind of information that way. That was a good system. Yeah, that's brilliant. Sometimes more complicated is not always the best. So I'm looking at this again, it looks like it is possible to download the code for a web app that you create, but not just a, an interactive web map. So the more like sophisticated web apps are downloadable. Um, I'm checking for story maps now. So I don't know. What is that? Do you know if that code can be run on its own somehow, or does it have to be like kind of like re-imported into ArcGIS online? Yeah. Um, Let's see. So here in the documentation, uh, I'll share the link to where I'm at. It says uh, you can create custom apps that you deploy on your your web server by downloading and configuring one of the ArcGIS configurable apps template. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's just as simple as uh, unzipping the, the the zip file that it gives you when it downloads and then putting that on a server and then everything works. Um, or you may have to recreate it with one of these templates that you can download. I'm not sure. I haven't worked in this. I haven't worked in this area of RTIS it, before. You know, it was a it was a few years ago, perhaps five or so years ago, and I was able to download a web app the way that Michael was describing, and I was able then to put it on just a standard web server. And it worked. It was one of the, the slider uh, web apps that allowed you to slide uh, from one map to another over the same geography. And it worked very well. I was able to just put it on a standard web server. Did it link to the um, data on RTIS Online or did you host the data too? I, I hosted the data from a, from a local map server, not from an yeah. Esri, but it was using one of Esri's uh, web apps. Yeah, it was probably using their like JavaScript Exactly. libraries yeah that's cool that's kind of like the same thing as doing like a google maps app where you're using google maps javascript api to like make a web map um you, yeah esri arcgis has its own kind of web app javascript which i've never i've never used before but I, I think it's kind of easy if you know how to do that sort of thing If there are folks in here and you've never uh, played around with ArcGIS Online or web maps and you're not exactly certain, let me tell you guys, uh, from what we covered in the GIS Sprint last summer, um, it is re the hardest part, if you're first getting into it, is figuring out how to get your credentials from your local institution, right? Once you have credentials and credits assigned to you, by your institution. Hopefully you'll see a single sign-on or an SSO somewhere. Uh, many universities have that set up. Alas, not we have not set that up yet. We're still issuing them manually. Uh, but once you can log into your institution's ArcGIS online account, you will be amazed. If you just carve a couple hours for yourself one afternoon, you'll be amazed at how much you can do with just intuition and just playing with it. It is really amazing.
And also, Josh, you don't even need your institu institutional login. You can have the free version, and then you can go in and play around with it. You just won't be able to save your work. That's the difference. Or you can still go into ArcGIS.com and create a public account and do lots of things with it. I think that kind of segues into maybe our wrap up. So we can wrap up and on time to make sure everybody has time to get back to their next session. Uh, so Josh, do you want to pull up the last slide for us? So I am going to drop links in the chat um, again in case you missed them at the beginning. Um, so you can visit our GIS interest group TDL page um, on the TDL website. And that has a link. I'm going to drop the direct link to sign up for our mailing list um, again as well. So make sure to visit the web page and sign up for the mailing list so that you can get regular updates about our meetings and also um, random questions like today when Diana uh, or Diane sent, sent the email um, about sharing. Um, and, and discoverability. Those are the kinds of things that we do um, exchange here and there. So also join us for our regular meetings. Um, we have regular monthly meetings on uh, currently they're on Fridays at 2 p.m. They're the last, I think it's the fourth Friday of the month. Um, so our next meeting is going to be scheduled for June 24th um, at 2 p.m. So uh, we will be sending out regular updates um, in, in the meantime, the week before the meetings so that you will have the Zoom information. So, um, and then also I wanna make sure we promote our other TCDL sessions. So um, Josh mentioned our next um, session is talking about the sprint that we hosted last. Um, I say we, I was not involved in hosting it, but I did participate in the learning sprint. Um, and so be sure to join uh, session 1H uh, to learn about that. The sprinting while juggling session will kind of talk, talk about uh, what we did. And, and um, again, we're gonna be doing a new uh, mini sprint this summer. Um, so you feel, feel free to join us and, and learn more about Python and its use in GIS. Um, and then also for those of us who are a little bit newer, I'm, I came into this group not knowing very much about GIS and I'm still definitely not an expert in GIS. Um, so tomorrow, uh, Michael Shensky, Sylvia Jones, and I are going to be hosting a introduction to ArcGIS Online workshop at 3 p.m. So that's session 2D. So be sure to join us for that um, for just a quick introductory workshop as an hour and a half. So hopefully it'll be pretty helpful for you guys. Um, so yeah, just um, again, just want to stress how great this group is. Um, you can join us to you know, build this network of great colleagues across Texas who are GIS enthusiasts, learn um, and share new skills. So you know, definitely this group is all about learning, but it's also about sharing. Um, and then you can represent your institution and uh, contribute to the development and implementation of new initiatives like the data collaboration subcommittee, we're building that shared um, infrastructure for uh, data collaboration, which is really exciting. And then also we develop a lot of different materials that you can uh, use for, your, for your, your own professional development or for your institution. So just want to strongly encourage you guys to get involved if you're interested. Um, that's basically it's, it's a great group. Plus, we're a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah, you definitely, definitely want to come, come visit us. So I think I will go ahead and turn it back over to Amanda to close us out. Thank you all. Great. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you all at other TCDL sessions. Y'all take care. Thanks, guys.